Well, 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 new faces uh, on the show. Hi, how's everyone out there? Uh, my going? name is John Helmkamp. Yeah, this is uh, Cover One NFL Draft Weekly. Uh, we are kicking this back off. I'm John Helmkamp, at John Helmkamp on the, the big Twitter, formerly known as Twitter, now X, whatever the hell you want to call it. This is my buddy, Daniel. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm never going to not call it Twitter, by the way. I'm always going to call it Twitter. I'll never refer to it in any other form, no matter how many times Elon changes his name. It's always going to be Twitter. You guys can find me there, on if I could ever talk, you know, at In Harm's Way 19. This is going to be a lot of fun. John and I have been, you know, fans of each other for a while, and now we come together to do a weekly draft talk show podcast. This is going to be fantastic. We got a great show, show for you today. So what's on the docket today, John? Yeah, we're going to go through a few things. Um, introduce ourselves. You get to know us a, a little bit better. Just tell you who we are, why we're here. Uh, then we're going to start going through the current NFL draft order uh, as it stands. There will be some you know, final shaking up happening this weekend, but we do know who has the first overall pick. Uh, we'll go through a segment called Stonks Up, where we're talking about a player whose draft stock is rising and kind of go into it and see what we think of this player. Uh, then we're going to start talking about the national championship preview. We're recording this on Thursday, January 4th, late in the evening. So we got a few days before the last regular season week of the NFL season. And then the following day, Natty, baby, we got a lot of, a lot of football on, on the docket from Saturday through yeah. Monday night. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then uh, start looking ahead to the senior bowl, which we will be at. So, Hey, yes. that's, that's going to be pretty rad. Uh, so that's what we're going to go through tonight and just kind of uh, set the set the tone and you get to know us and what to expect from this show, which is uh, two dudes that are going to keep it pretty straight, <laughs> tell you what we think, <laughs> not tell you what not we gonna, don't think. Not yeah. sugarcoating anything, guys. This is this is me 100% real. That's the only way I do it. Only way I'll ever do it. Same here. Um, so, yeah, getting into it. Welcome to the party, pal, uh, John Helmkamp. So I started talking with Cover One uh, about any uh, any opportunities, and they wanted to revitalize this this avenue of theirs, talking about the NFL draft from a national angle. So if you are seeing this and you follow a lot of the Cover One stuff that is Bills centric, um, I am a I'm a Bills fan. Uh, Daniel is not. I don't hold it against him. Um, but this show is from a national angle. We're talking broad picture stuff. We're going to go over a lot of prospects, a lot of in depth look at them. I know that Daniel and I both spend a lot of time looking at these players so that you don't have to. Um, yes. We're going to break it down and uh, get into a lot of a lot of details along the way, but keeping everything pretty high level and digestible as well. We'll, we'll nerd out some, I'm sure, but you know, I think this is a show that's supposed to encompass a lot of things and be uh, appealing to a wide variety of uh, knowledge levels you know, whether you've heard of these names before or it's the first time you're ever hearing about them, we're going to give you information on those guys. Yeah, this is, just, like I said, this is going to be a lot of fun for, for me and myself to get, get to know you guys and try to just build a new fan base for a new show on Cover One that is going to talk about everything you guys are interested in all year long. This isn't going to stop after the draft. We're going to get into the next class almost right away. As, as much as we can. I you know, I've, I was already doing a lot of draft coverage before, and now I'm going to do even more to get more knowledgeable on as many prospects as possible. So I think from here on out, that's what this is now, guys. This is now into the Draft Weekly Podcast. And, and what I really like to talk about is you, you, talked to, you said we were talking about the Chicago Bears first. Like They have the number one overall draft pick. Thank you, Carolina Panthers, really, pretty much, because they obviously went and got Bryce Young, and now the Chicago Bears have that pick. This situation is very interesting. There's a lot of different things that can happen. There's going to be so much talk from now until if there's a trade, until draft day, all this fun stuff about the, the Bears. So you are on the clock now, right, Chicago? There's a lot of intricate things that can happen. Justin Fields. I want to know what you think, John. What are you doing with Justin Fields right now? So... First and foremost, absolutely fascinating that we have a team that holds the first overall pick in back-to-back -back yeah. years. I know this one is by virtue of the trade of last year's first overall pick. 
a wild stuff because didn't everyone have this talk last year? Yes. <laughs> but guess the what? Exact same talk. We're looking at the same thing again. <laughs> what do we know about Justin Fields now that we didn't know about him a year ago? I don't know that we've really learned a whole lot because he missed some games with injuries. I think here down the second half of the season, he's putting together some really good performances. I think he's looking a little more comfortable. Um, but I think it's going to be basically the same conversation as last year, just with the prospects that were coming out of last year's draft. Now, hey, if everyone knew C.J. Stroud was going to look how he's looked in the NFL, yeah. I think that the Bears would have held the first overall pick and taken C.J. But hindsight's always twenty twenty. Now we have potentially Caleb Williams, I will say potentially, until he announces that he is declaring. Mm -hmm. We do know that we have Drake May in this draft class. He has declared. Uh, we do know that there's a slew of other quarterbacks that – you never know who's going to make a late surge. I think it would take a lot to usurp the number one overall spot from Caleb Williams at this point. But Michael Penix Jr. has looked great, looked fantastic in his semifinal matchup. Now he gets a, uh, a national championship bid going against Michigan's great defense. Who knows? If he balls out with another four or five touchdowns, maybe he starts knocking on the door. I don't know. I think it would take a lot to knock Caleb Williams off at this point. But I think if I'm Chicago – as much as I love Justin Fields, and for people out there who are familiar mm -hmm. with me, I was a huge Justin Fields fan back in college for him. I think that Chicago did him very few favors in his development uh, getting into the NFL. And as good as I think Chicago, or as good as I think Justin Fields is, I, I think that it's a really hard thing to pass up selecting first overall in back-to-back -back years and resetting the clock for the organization getting onto a new rookie contract where you potentially have Caleb Williams on that rookie number for four mm -hmm. years, four years on a roster that has already shown a lot of improvement. So I think it'd be tough not to make the pick. Although there's some good reports out there of some massive trade hall compensation that they could be looking at. And if that's the case, I think it's, it's, it's hard to look at this as a bad option either way. Yeah. My, my consideration with this comes down to Matt Eberflus because Matt Eberflus, I'm still not sold that he's a great head coach. I think he's a very not. good defensive coordinator. And what we're seeing right now is that they got a pass rusher. And right now they've kind of simplified the scheme, in my opinion. There's not such complication as that their secondary can play well when you have a little bit more pressure up front. And that's what you know Matt Eberflus was hired for. He's hired to come fix the defense. And this year he finally kind of did when they went and got uh, Montez Sweat. The problem for me is that let's say next year, Matt Eberflus, he does the same thing that he did the first two years, which is, well, we don't really know what we're doing in the first half of the season, but in the second half, we kind of figured it out. There, He's going to get fired if he, he yeah. comes back and that happens again. And then you string Caleb Williams for, with this coaching staff, and that's uh, they're all gone the next year, and he has to learn a new system, like the same thing that happened to Justin Fields. When you continuously do this, this is how bad teams stay bad. We, we've seen it multiple times over. It's what's going to happen to Bryce Young. Bryce Young is not – I don't know what's going to happen specifically because we, we can't see the future, but this is how bad teams stay bad. And the Chicago Bears, while everything that is going hunky-dory right now with Matt Eberflus, everyone's feeling really good. Justin Fields is playing well. The defense is playing like Chicago-style defense. It's in the cold. That snow game just reminds you of, like, Rex Grossman back in 2000, <laughs> like all those teams, right? With the good defense and, and smoking the, Jay Cutler, baby. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> it, it just it feels like if they stick with Eberflus, it has to be Fields. To me, yeah, personally, because I, I, and again, you trade down, you get more draft compensation, and you fill out your team. You still need another wide receiver. DJ Moore is fantastic. Darna Mooney. See ya. You, you're not developing. You've gone backwards. You're not You're not really helping. They need more wide receivers. They need some more offensive line help. It's still, there's still a lot of things that need to be done there. And then you can add yeah. more pass rushers, some linebacker help, secondary help to your defense too. So personally, again, this is me. If I'm bringing back Matt Eberflus, which right now is there's been a report that it, they're leaning that direction. So I, I have two ways. If you bring it, if you keep him, I'm keeping Justin Fields. And then if not, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trade Justin Fields and then I'm going to draft Caleb Williams number one. So let's let's play devil's advocate here for a second to look at the other side of it. So there's also reports out there that they are re reportedly that they could get more for the 101 this year than they got last mm -hmm. year. Last year from Carolina, they traded down to the 10th overall pick. They picked up a 2023 second, 
2024 first, this year's first mm-hmm. overall pick, 2025 second, and they got DJ Moore, who looks like an all-pro <laughs> wide receiver right now. Dude's been just tearing it up. Yeah, Whenever absolutely. Fields has been on the field, DJ Moore has looked like a top five to eight wide receiver in the NFL. He looks phenomenal. No one's talking about it because Chicago sucks. But DJ Moore has been balling. So they're saying that they think Chicago can get more than that and stay in the top five of this year's draft class. Because if you look at the teams that are knocking on the door right behind them, it's not set in stone yet. Some things can still shake out between two and five, the picks. But Washington, quarterback needy. New England, quarterback needy. Arizona, potentially. Don't know what choice they would make with Kyler, but if they feel like they could trade him and move on, I think they would look into that. And the Giants absolutely have to be thinking quarterback as well. Any one of those four teams could be interested in a trade-up package to first overall for the rights to Caleb Williams because, by all accounts, Caleb Williams is one of the most elite quarterback prospects to come out in the last decade plus. So Mm -hmm. if they can stay in that range – now here's here's a a real devil's advocate. Last year – there were rumors of Ryan Poles, GM for the Bears, trying to pull off a double trade down. Yeah. Does he get it done this year because of the multiple quarterbacks in this draft class? If he's able to swap with New England and then the Giants want to trade up with Washington, well, they're both NFC East, so that wouldn't happen. But Arizona wants to trade up with Washington to get Drake May. Could they do this like double shakedown situation and just stockpile? things to put around Justin Fields. It's possible. It's, and if they can yeah, stay not, in the top five, even if they don't trade down again, even if they don't pull off the double trade down, you talked about them needing a top tier secondary wide receiver, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors. There are very, very good top tier wide receiver prospects coming out this year. Yeah, the trade down, the double trade down this year wouldn't be that 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 bad because you're not talking about going outside the top 10 or even down into like right. eight or nine where you're going to miss out. You're talking about trading down to two or three and then down to five, maybe, or four. And you can still get any of those guys. And that's the allure to this whole situation, right? Because because you have Drake May, because you have Caleb Caleb Williams. All this information that, I mean, you you can put them up against Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud. I I would bet right now C.J. Stroud, because you have real evidence to the fact, would be number one over all of those players as of now because you have legitimate information. But as prospects... I would think it would go. It would have gone one Caleb Williams, and then Drake May, and then CJ Stroud, and then Br- or Bryce Young and CJ Stroud. However, you had that, and, and that's what we're seeing right now. Is we're seeing teams right. like to go with that. We have Caleb Williams, we have Drake May. There's also been talk about Drake May being a lot of other GMs' favorites yep. over Caleb Williams. That's another thing too. You have all these things to consider, so it's not out of the realm of possibilities for them to specifically just be like, look. We're open for business, guys. We're open for business. Come bring your draft picks. Come bring everyone, your receivers, if you want. We'll figure they, we'll figure this out. And I would not put it past Ryan Poles in the, in the slightest to say, look what we did last year. I think we got the coach. I think we have the quarterback. And we need a little bit more around them to make this work. It's absolutely within not just their own possibilities, but it's highly likely, yeah. in my opinion, if they go that way. Yeah, I think so too. And if it is Washington, you know damn well Chicago is going to be getting their own second back in that trade. <laughs> you're, we're not you're leaving it without it. They're going full draft day. I want my picks back. And they're getting their their, fir- their first pick of the second round back in that deal with Washington as well, if they can make that happen. So looking outside the top five, though, there are still plenty of teams out there that yeah. need quarterback that are not in that range. Boy, it sounds like it would take a, a truckload to move past the offers that they could potentially have from other teams. But some of those teams include Atlanta, who right now would be sitting with the ninth overall pick if it ended today. Uh, the Las Vegas Raiders sitting at 11. Uh, who else outside do you think could be an interesting candidate to make a move up? I mean, I, I, I've had my eyes on the uh, the Raiders for quite a while. I think that it makes the most sense specifically because, I mean, Right now, their defense is playing extremely well. And you still have Devontae Adams. You're assuming maybe Josh Jacobs stays around. Um, Probably not, but looks like Zamir White's played well. And I think that that's something that they're looking forward to. Their offensive line hasn't played badly, but you still have um, foundational pieces on the offensive defense if, you know, that's if Devontae Adams stays with him and Max Crosby. So 
they've been one of the biggest names that I'm looking at. But when we go outside Minnesota, I mean, Minnesota is right now playing Nick Mullins, Jaron Hall, Josh Dobbs, uh, Kirk Cousins probably doesn't come back. But then again, maybe because of what they dealt with over the past couple of weeks, months, maybe they rethink their Kirk Cousins situation. He comes back to play for them. Um, I, I don't rule out anything past, <clears throat> past New Orleans. New Orleans continuously puts the chips in all the time. Derek yep. Carr is not it. Derek Carr is yep. not it. So if they can find a way to move off him and then trade up, I wouldn't put it past them. They continuously do this year after year. They did it this year, and they don't seem to care about paying for it. And actually, they're going to keep pushing it down the road so they never have to worry about it anyway. So yeah. th those are a couple teams. I know people think Denver, they don't have the draft capital to go up and do anything. They just don't. Um, and, and then the other – team possibly the last one that i think might make a real significant push to get into that top uh five six range depending how it is is seattle they're a wild card in this because i like geno smith i i do i'm a big geno smith fan but you have to have the conversation can we get a, to a super bowl championship with geno smith can we do it i don't know i don't know really the answer to that question because this is his second yeah. year as a, a successful starter and then we know Drew Locke isn't it. So the, the, I think Seattle is the wild card team in this situation that if they feel like they don't have the quarterback to get there, we know they had the pieces, DK Metcalf, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. They have the one, two punch at running back, two left tackles that are young, or two, excuse me, two tackles that are young. They have mm -hmm. the, the means draft capital wise, lots of youth on defense. They're a team that I would not rule out moving up to try and get their guy. Yeah, I could uh, I could definitely see it. I think it would take a lot for them to for get sure. up there. It would. Um, Not just we're talking about like that's some, a big that's a big jump too. Yeah, yeah, that's a really big jump, and especially um, with with the needs that Chicago has. You know, are they going to have enough picks to get up there and take a look at it? I'm trying to pull it up right now, and for some reason, I'm just not finding. Oh, here we go. Okay, future picks. So they've got their own first. They've got two thirds this year with no second. So then you'd have to start looking ahead to future years. Yeah. And I believe they hold all their own future firsts. I don't think they have any extra future firsts in there. All the picks that no, came I over from the that, Russell yeah. Wilson trade have, have expired. So I think that's pretty much it. But I think they'd have to be they'd have to be trading away starting picks yeah. or starting players to go Absolutely. along with that in order to make that jump. So I think. If I think if I'm if I'm being realistic about it, I've got a hard time thinking that Chicago doesn't stay in the top five. Yeah, for um, sure. In this, I'm, in I'm this, with you. this draft class, and and if they do, and they can pick up that and a haul in the future, and then they still got their own first, which is sitting around ten right now. You could be <laughs> double dipping at wide receiver. You could potentially be looking oh, at boy. Martin Harrison Jr. and Joe Alt on the offensive line. Yep, you've got a lot of possibilities to get really good really fast if you're Chicago where you're looking at them potentially being a playoff team in a year. I mean, they're seven and nine right now. They're not yeah, like, they're not a two or three win team. They've won seven games in a season where fields has been hurt. So if he's healthy and they can add a couple just top tier blue chip prospects into that team, they could start making some noise. Absolutely. Uh, they're not, they're not that far off, especially if their defense can continue to play the way that it has. And while I'm still 100% not sold on their offense yet, I'm, I'm not quite there yet because there still is really reliant on getting players broken open deep down the field. And I, grant, I love Justin Fields too. I'm a big Fields guy. I think that he's yeah. got a lot of tools, but I'm, I'm more curious on how the process and the situation has hampered him as a quarterback because it does happen. It happens all the time. And sometimes the tools that they have lift them when you don't have the mental processing or you don't have the key, you know, he doesn't keep his eyes down the field when he moves outside the pocket. That's the big thing right now. His eyes come down very quickly. Still, if it's not in the pocket, if he's not throwing it down the field, right up, right, right, right. When it's there, the eyes come down because he's looking to make something play and make a play. And it works. Don't get me wrong. It works, but there's, there's a big reason that guys like Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield, who's having a resurgence right now in Tampa Bay because of that exact reason, He's throwing the ball down the field. <laughs> He's throwing it down the field when he doesn't have to worry about the pass rush and all that stuff that, that comes in, moving him off of a spot and making him step up in the pocket. He can get the ball downfield. So 
I'm I'm with you. I do think that the Chicago Bears stay inside the top five with that number one pick. I don't again. I don't think anything outside of getting down to five is outside their own possibilities right now. They definitely seem like a team that has a lot of options in front of them. It's going to be very fun to see how it plays out. Yes, it is. So let's look at the top ten uh, as it is here. I think it seems pretty well locked in that Caleb Williams and Drake may look like they're going in the top ten, yeah. potentially with the first two picks of this NFL draft, depending on how it all shakes out. The rest of the quarterback class seems like a bit of an enigma, doesn't it? You seem to have, you have Jaden Daniels, you have Michael Penix Jr., you have even Bo Nix, who doesn't look like a top 10 pick, but maybe a first round pick potentially, depending on how he does in Mobile. Um, But how many of these quarterbacks do you think teams are going to be trying to scoop up inside the top five or top 10 draft picks coming up? So I'm pretty confident to go in the top five. I mean, we all know the two. There is going to be one player that I do think sneaks into the top five, and that's Jaden Daniels. And it's it's because of the because of what he does with his legs. He is the most electric runner in this class at quarterback. He just is. He's he can take it to the house like Justin Fields can do. He's got that type of athleticism and quickness to him. And the, the reason he's better than a Drake May or a Caleb Williams in that because that explosion. He explodes and it's it's zero to sixty in like no time flat. So I think Jaden Daniels is going to be someone that a lot of teams take a hard look at at look if we're going to go up and get this guy, we have to make sure that it's all there. Obviously He's a little bit older of a prospect, and teams typically take their time with that as well. So there's going to be a big process to figure out, you know, why was he in college as long as he was? What happened? I mean, obviously, he was at Arizona State first. Arizona State's not known for producing the best quarterbacks in the world. So he goes to LSU, and we've seen development. The athleticism athleticism is there. We've seen the accuracy, the ball placement, uh, and throwing the ball down the field at all levels of the field is really ticked up there. So I think for me – um, the one godly guy that I would say goes in the top five as that really could be traded up for is Jaden Daniels. Yeah, Jaden Daniels was at Arizona State through multiple coaching changes, including yeah. the uh, Herm Edwards experience yeah. <laughs> out there, out there in Arizona, and then goes sorry, over Herm. to LSU. So he's in, yeah, no kidding. Sorry, Herm, uh, you played <laughs> to win the game. Sorry, bud. Don't don't shoot the messenger. Um, five years in college. And over the last three years, including two years at LSU and his last year at Arizona State, his rushing numbers increased all three years. I think he started learning how to utilize his athleticism more, using it to his advantage. But unlike Fields in that regard, he does keep his eyes down the field. It's not that he's just quick to, I think, break the pocket and run for Mm -hmm. it, although he's very capable of it. But you do see him continue to try and stretch plays before taking off. And I think that's going to serve him well. Um, Looking at his stats in 2021, he had 710 rushing yards and six touchdowns. 2022, 885 and 11. That was his first year in LSU. This year, your Heisman Trophy winner, by the way, which we haven't even tacked onto his (laughs) name yet, had 1,134 rushing yards and 10 rushing touchdowns as a quarterback. To go along with actual passing numbers, Boys and girls, he had 3,800, 3,812 passing yards and 40 passing touchdowns. So it's not like he was just a running quarterback and that's why he got the nod. The guy can sling it also. He has some great playmakers to throw to, but hey, absolutely can't hold that against him. Didn't hold it against Joe Burrow when he won it. So Jaden Daniels, I agree with you. Very interesting. I think Michael Penix Jr., though, is looking very surgical in the college football playoffs and particularly he's done it all year, but now getting on this national stage. Dude is just throwing frozen ropes. I mean, he's got a cannon of an arm <laughs> and he places it where it needs to be placed. So he could crash the party in the top 10 too. It wouldn't surprise me. No, it wouldn't. And then, like I said, this this kind of showcase, much like we saw CJ Stroud last year, had a showcase against Georgia. That showcase against Texas, which again, we're going to talk about in a little bit, it was fantastic. Michael Penix knew, like, look, I got to show everybody what I can do. I, I might have some injuries. Yeah. Last, you know, these last two years, I've been healthy. I'm going to come out here and I'm going to move around the pocket a little bit. I'm going to take some, some quarterback keepers. Like he, they, they ran some quarterback three yeah. option. They did a lot of things to showcase his, I mean, I would say his linear a- athleticism and his lateral all the way straightforward to keep him in a straight line. We don't want to see the lateral stuff. It's not his best tools, but he's yeah. going to have another opportunity against Michigan to do that. So yeah, he was very, very impressive against Texas. 
Yeah, it was a fantastic showing. So before we get into the national championship uh, preview, we, we were going back and forth uh, in our text where we're planning out our, our first show and what we want the show to be. And we're like, hey, you know, there's this wide receiver from LSU named Brian Thomas Jr. who's getting just all kinds of buzz right now and the hype's going nuts on him. We should have a segment where we talk about players uh, that are on the rise. And we we threw around a couple names. And, and what did we land on? Man, it's, it's it's all for the stonks up, guys. Stonks, stonks up. You guys up, know. Baby. You guys know what it is. This is what it's about. <laughs> We've got players every single week. It seems like someone else is driving up the draft boards. And so, what we're going to do? We're going to break them down. We both looked at the film of Brian Thomas Jr. You know, he's six foot four, two hundred five pounds. That is not verified. We will get those obviously at the combine because I don't think he's going to any of the uh, All Star mm -hmm. as of right now. Um, we'll see a bit a little, little bit later, but. I watched three games. I got versus Alabama. I've got Florida and Florida State. So quick thoughts on Brian uh, Brian Thomas Jr. The guy is explosive. Very, uh, He's an excellent vertical receiver. He has that 0-60 to 60 gear and then excellent ball tracking over his shoulder, outstretching arms. He attacks the balls with his hands down the field, which is what you want to see. You don't want to see him you know, flapping his arms around. You don't want to see them disconnected at the catch point like when you see marquez valdez scantling you see J quentin johnston sometimes their hands are far apart and that's a lot of the big reason why they don't catch these deep balls they can see it just fine but then when it comes down your hands are far apart and you drop the football so brian thomas you all do, those you things do one of these <laughs> yeah yeah we don't want the alligator arms guys you we don't want that we, we don't we, we don't want that uh, he's really good i think sensing the sideline as well he, he knows yeah. where he is on the field at all times he keeps his feet in bounds all the way down the field when and again when you're watching him he does he has all of that vertical aspect to him i liked his his ball his excuse me his release variety his release packages he has a lot of different things that he does trying to work those corners and then get to the inside get to the outside and then he uses that acceleration i thought that was really nice to see my my, my big takeaway here is that i'm not sold on him as a creating space for himself player I think that he's a bit high hipped in his break in his breakdowns. They're inconsistent. He can add some steps to his curls. Any type of breaks over the middle of the field, <clears throat> he doesn't always get down into his breaks and then explode out of them. Sometimes you see him just kind of curl it off or round it off, come down and not all the way back to the football or breaking across the field. So his his route tree not developed as well. It's very very limited from the the, the three games that I've got. We got some you know I got some slants. You got some goes and you have some drag routes. It's not hugely varied, and yeah. I know that you know Kool Aid McKinstry is a is a big name cornerback. Absolutely shut him down for the most part. Like one on one, there there was no answers for that. And that you know I know he's going to be a pretty decent cornerback in the NFL, but uh, I have some questions about him. So all in all, I think he's going to be a really explosive player. He's going to add to whatever offense takes him, especially as like a number two, number three kind of guy. I, I'm personally as we're seeing him rise up here i've seen a couple of places where he's like in the top half of the first round and i'm just yeah. like god we got we got to calm down a little bit here but talk me off the ledge here john tell me why i'm wrong about maybe jumping to conclusions about ryan thomas yeah so let's let's talk about what i agree with with you um his explosiveness is great at 6'4 205 roughly i think that's where we've got him listed right now the dude just eats up ground. He is such a long strider when he gets when he gets into gear. When he gets mm -hmm. a step, it's the old saying if he's even, he's leaving. Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna catch him. He will pull away. And what I love about him is his ability to stack defenders on, especially those deep routes. When he's able to stack a defender behind him, he has really late and really great hands, which is awesome. You love that trade in a wide receiver because it doesn't cue the defender into when to turn around and make a break yeah. on the ball. So his late hands are fantastic. Um, you mentioned his body control and his sideline awareness. Those are phenomenal. This guy led the country in receiving touchdowns this year mm -hmm. from the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, Jaden Daniels. Everyone and their neighbor is talking about <laughs> – neighbors that's funny that was an unintentional pun you love to see it malik neighbors though and i agree malik neighbors is in a different tier from brian thomas jr i think in a lot of other draft classes he'd be the first wide receiver taken but this one happens to have marvin harrison jr and roma dunze <laughs> both just phenomenal i mean the, the top three wide receivers in this draft class are as good as it gets yeah from a fantastic perspective but brian thomas jr 
had a really great season. The production is there. He's an early declare. He's a big guy. And I like a lot of his films. So you said that he tends to stay high hipped. Mm -hmm. I think part of that could be a little bit of the route that they ask him to do most of the time. But I think that there are examples out there of him really sinking his hips well and getting down low at, at the break in a route, especially for a guy as tall as he is. So is he going to be one of the best route runners in this draft class? No, I don't think he is at all. But I think that he has tools where he can be at least a starter quality route runner. I don't think it's a hindrance to him. I don't think that his route yeah. running is a you know below average detractor to his game. I think he has the tools and the athleticism and the mobility in his routes where that can be an area that's improved upon at the next level. He didn't quite get there yet. This is almost a guy that I I almost wish he stayed back another year. This wide receiver draft class is incredibly loaded. Like There are so many wide receivers in it. And if Malik Neighbors was going, he would have the opportunity potentially to yeah. have his own limelight next year if he stayed at LSU. That's what Romo Dunze did. He didn't have to compete with the Malik Neighbors. But everyone thought Odunze was coming out last year. He came back for his senior year, and he got better. And now I yeah. think he helped his draft stock and he's, he's killing it. And he's in the conversation with, you know, a top 10 draft pick, potentially 10 to 15. So I could see Thomas almost using a little bit of more development time in that regard. But I think that he is very athletic with very sure hands, great body control and ability to improve in the route running. I think he could be a guy that's looked at almost in a T Higgins type of role, um, for, for another team who does operate as the two to Jamar Chase. But T. Higgins, I think, is a, is a decent comp here from the size, from the athleticism, from the high point ability, the boundary body control. And I don't I don't like throwing comps around just for the sake of throwing comps around. I don't I, yeah. I don't agree with that. But this is a guy that I saw comparisons when I was watching the film a little bit. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Kind of a longer armed, taller wide receiver with good boundary and, and deep ball skills. So I like him. I think, I think I'm higher on him than you are. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how my grades all shake out because I'm a nerd and I spreadsheet everything and I grade all these guys. <laughs> all these grades. Um, but as of right now, I think he's, I think he's in the key on Coleman, Troy Franklin arena for me. I think those guys might both be above him, but I think he's, he's, he's surging right now for sure. The stonks are up guys. And I think that, uh, I think he's going to put himself into that late first conversation. Yeah. The, I think the, the, the point here that I, that I want to make is that we've seen, I personally, like I was high on Deami Brown coming out of North Carolina a few years ago. I was high on Terrace Marshall. And, and honestly, I'm watching Brian Thomas. I see a little bit of those players in him. I see a little bit of it. So I'm not, I'm not going to let past evaluations like impact his. I'm just, be a little bit more open to eh, maybe he doesn't develop because I saw, you know, I saw some yep. stuff from these guys and I'm just like, I, I can see where they develop, but um, absolutely. No stocks are up right now. He's, I think he's going to go. If he doesn't go at the end of the first, I think he's going to be a second round player, like a really high second round yep. player. Those first five guys, you might see a team come up and say, Hey, we need to go trade up to get him because he's not going to last very long in the second round. We see this happen quite a bit. Um, you know, I think teams did it last year. You know, they, they didn't trade up for it, but they, you know, these wide receivers end up going pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, he's definitely going to be a guy at the end of that first, second round consideration. That that just it makes a lot of sense with the size, the speed. That's really what teams want, especially for their complementary wide receivers. Don't be surprised if you see a team that has a number one and say, "Hey, we really like what this guy brings to the team to the table, and we can complement our offense and give us our, our quarterback some easy options down the field." So that all that from a, a construction roster construction and team perspective makes a ton of sense yeah i think it's really interesting first and foremost i had no idea that terrace marshall and diami brown were two of your guys because they were two of my guys also yeah and so you're like oh okay cool <laughs> that kind of works um so i hear what you're saying i remember the last time that i was very high on the number two wide receiver coming out of lsu and it didn't go that well for me in terrace marshall so <laughs> i i have a little bit of the 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 flashbacks in my head just, yeah a little bit of a, a little, little bit, bit of a twitch <laughs> when it comes to brian thomas so i'm trying not to be too hyper but i i like what you said not every player is going to develop they're exactly. not going to there's a range of outcomes on all of these guys i think the range of outcomes for brian thomas jr on a high high end 
is like a T Higgins type because he possesses some of those similar traits, but he also could be Terrace Marshall Jr. Uh, or um, uh, Quentin Johnson uh, in the Chargers, who is just really not succeeding well in his first year as well. So there is a wide range, but I agree with you. I think teams are going to like the tools that they see and the yeah. size and the athleticism that they see and go, Hey, we could, we could work with that and try to make that into a thing for our offense. So I think he's a, an interesting name and definitely, definitely going to get a noteworthy draft stock, whether it's a top 15 pick, like some of these mock drafts are saying or not, it shouldn't be. Don't no. draft him top 15. <laughs> don't do that. No, actually, you know, I'm a Chiefs fan. Please do bring one of these guys down a little <laughs> bit further so we don't have to move up so much. <laughs> yeah, you want what you want to see is you want to see him go so that Troy Franklin is still on the board for Kansas City. I think he's going to be anyway, personally. But um, yeah, that's yeah, neither yeah. here nor there. If you guys can't tell, you know, I'm wearing, you know, if you're listening on, you know, podcast form, I'm wearing a Michigan hat. I am a Michigan fan. So that brings me great joy to say that they finally got over the hump at least Everybody. the first one, and got through to the national championship game. It's here, guys. On Monday, the Washington Huskies face off against my Michigan Wolverines. The first time since the 90s, both teams have gotten back at least one and have an option to win a national championship. Those games, the semifinal matchups, were amazing. Oh. They were so good. Um Beautiful. I just watching the end of that Michigan game was painful. It was stressful. And then I saw Blake Corum guys, Blake Corum is so good. He's such a fantastic short area, finesse, power, vision, burst. He has all those things. I wish he had a little bit more long speed, but those injuries kind of zapped a little bit of it from him, but everything else, it's so good. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about these quarterbacks, right? Michael yeah, Penix yeah. Jr. Versus JJ McCarthy. Both are supposed to go to the draft. Both are in conversation to be in the first round of the draft. Michael Penix, J.J. McCarthy. Let's talk. I want to hear your thoughts on Michael Penix because out of Indiana, the guy had a couple of, obviously, injury plague seasons. Yeah. People write him off. They say, well, this guy, he's got talent, but he's just he's injury prone. He's not, not going to be able to be a guy that stays on the field all the time. He transfers to Washington. We have two years now where he has been not just – productive he's been healthy and he's been leading them to where they are right now what are your thoughts on michael Penix jr i'm i'm a huge michael Penix jr fan um i i love him i do think that the injury history is the only thing that's going to keep some people from saying yeah he's easily a top 10 draft pick quarterback i mean what we're seeing out of him the last two years has been incredible great completion percentage Mm -hmm. taking shots down the field. That offense was like basically an, an old Texas Tech air raid offense. They were bombing yeah. it. Although they also <laughs> had some muscle uh, running backs that were capable of grinding out some yards too. But he was bombing that thing down the field. He averaged 9.2 yards per attempt this year. That's a that's a pretty healthy number. That's healthy. <laughs> and logged, yeah, over the last two seasons, he has 66 passing touchdowns and 17 interceptions. So he protects the ball. He's bombs away he puts it on a dot and on a frozen rope when he needs to to get it between defenders his ability to manipulate in the pocket like you brought up a little bit earlier in the show i think is one of his most underrated traits the guy doesn't take sacks he just doesn't get sacked i don't have the number right in front of me but i think he had like six the entire year or something like that i think it was under 10 but he does not take sacks so he he stays ahead of the sticks and a lot of times you think of these quarterbacks that are dropping back and bombing it down the field with these high yard uh, per attempt averages that they have to sit back there in the pocket and that it's going to leave them open to those opportunities to fall behind the sticks. Penix doesn't do that for you. So he's a a left-handed quarterback. The lazy comparison is to uh, guys. He's yeah, not too. Uh, he's not a completely Tua. different quarterback. Don't do that just because he's lefty. Please don't. But he showcased like everything that you want to see in the semifinal game, his ability to maneuver in the pocket, to extend plays, to put it on a dot between two safeties, to work this, the boundaries, everything that you want. I, I don't know how you can say he's not a top 10 draft pick as long as his medicals checked out and he's been healthy for two straight years. So I don't think there's a concern there either. 
So I think I think one of these teams that doesn't pull off the trade up with Chicago and sits there and they look at it and go, you know what, we're going to take our chance on them, even if it's at like five, fifth or sixth overall. I think they're going to be incredibly happy that they didn't have to give up essentially four first round picks to get a quarterback when Michael Penix Jr. in some cases straight up outplayed Caleb Williams this year. So I, I think he's a great quarterback prospect. I really do. And I think he's got a potential bright future as long as he goes to an organization that's ready to support him. You know, just talk about the interception numbers really quickly. 66 to 17, right, the, over the yeah. last two seasons. And that's for a guy that is the probably most fearless thrower in football. He does not care about windows. He is basically Geno Smith. Geno Smith <laughs> he makes his own windows. <laughs> he, yeah, exactly. He does not care about – and yeah. it's funny. That's my comp. Is, is I think he can be – the high level Geno Smith play probably from last season, 2022 Geno Smith. I think that is his ceiling. I think as a guy who's not going to do a ton as a rusher, but he manipulates the pocket. He reads, he throws into windows. He creates his own. He is unafraid of any moment, any throw anywhere on the field. And that can be your greatest weapon or your greatest hindrance at times. Depends on how you manage it. Obviously. However, See, Baker he didn't throw picks. <laughs> exactly. Like, he he does like, that, but he doesn't turn it over. It's like it, it's, it's the fantastic. best of both worlds. It's it's awesome. Though I have some questions because I don't think he's a top 10 pick. If you flush him to his right, it's not good. It is yeah. very bad. You like watching the game against Texas, they didn't blitz him. And the times where they got pressure, he they was rushed to his left. He was like, Hey, I can do this pretty easily. And it was no big deal. He was able to throw the ball down the field, still keep his eyes up. But when he has moved off a spot to his right, the eyes do come down. They don't scan the field like they usually do. And he, even though he has that rope, he has a tendency to lay it up there a little bit. We saw that pass interference to Romo Dunzig on the left sideline. He just kind of kind of chucked it up a little bit. The arm motion isn't consistently all the time through. He, yeah. he gets comps to Philip Rivers with his wonky his wonky release. Yep. And with that, you will have some a tendency to every now and then the ball just sails on him or it stays up in the air for forever. It's almost like a punt at times. So I I've, I think he's such a polarizing quarterback. This game against Michigan's defense, oh, oh boy. this is huge. This is so <laughs> big for him. Minter is going to do everything he can to th make him move to his right, to make him uncomfortable, to make him bring his eyes down. If you are to get after Michael Penix, to force the ball to become turnovers, not get it to their playmakers down the field, to make them have to throw the ball intermediately. It's make him uncomfortable. It's maybe put some deep tears on the back end and just say, hey, you have to throw the ball into the middle of the field and work your way down a little bit. But also we're going to mix in some, some blitzes. You're not going to really know what's happening here. So this matchup between Penix and Minter is one of the most intriguing storylines yeah. that I think that we've seen that, 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 that this – playoff could have come to and because of what he Penix did against Texas is why this matchup now is so detrimental it's going to be so much fun to watch I can't wait to see it and we have the opposite side the guy yeah. who came talk in me, so so talk to me <laughs> talk to me about JJ because JJ McCarthy has gone through the full pendulum swing several times yeah, in his college absolutely. football career from early bust to on fire to what is he doing, to looking like a Heisman candidate, to we barely throw the ball on offense anymore. I don't know what J.J. McCarthy is. I think he has tools and traits. I'm having a hard time seeing him right now as a first-round pick. Um, but he's got some experience. He has some upside. He has, he has arm. He has things that make him intriguing if you're looking at it like a day-two quarterback. But I don't think – he's done enough, especially the second half of this season to warrant first round draft pick. No, <laughs> no, he's, he's not. And, and I think he should go back myself, but the problem is interesting. Yeah. I think it's funny about two months ago. If you would ask me, I would have said he's coming out. I would have said he's going to come out. I, I'm Same, not the first half yet. of the season. First half of the season, JJ was yeah. looking really good. And then all of a sudden they had games where he threw the ball, like what? 11 times, you know, in a, yeah. Game. Like, and then you have games where he comes off the field for a younger, athletic running quarterback. Do you see right. many times where good elite elite quarterbacks come off the field for backups in college? No, <laughs> you don't. It's the, the, uh, it's the New Orleans. Season. It's the New Orleans Saints uh, game <laughs> right? plan, though. It's the Taysom Hill effect. Yeah, 
It is. It's 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 tough. So JJ McCarthy is an enigma. He can the very first play of Al- of the Alabama game is what he is. You watch him, he's staring down his receiver. It's a rollout to the right, so it's a half field yeah. read. That's all it is. It's a half field read. He's staring down the guy who's had, picking out. He had two it's a routes, right? play. He, he had a it's, high, he had a high low. It's like a, it's like, a, like an out wins. route and a little in a smaller out route. It's like a corner yeah. out. What, what do you want to call it? But he, the the guy who's running the corner route picks the the defender off of the out route, who's wide open, by the way. No one around him. By the time JJ gets there, we have the corner running down on him, and then he almost throws an interception, trying to throw it away. So that's the JJ McCarthy experience. And then he comes out, and they do the trick play, where he's falling backwards to his left and just whips it. <laughs> it just whips it. We got to talk Wilson. about the one-handed catch that he made before yeah, making the throw. <laughs> like, it was I don't a, even know. It was a you know trick play the ball gets thrown back to him and the guy has to go up like obj and pick this thing out land and then sling and he throws a rope and you're like who are you yeah that's that that is right there those two plays are the jj mccarthy experience that's who he is and a lot of it has to do with the fact at least in my opinion i'm not you know i don't know everything that is called in that offense but they don't let him get comfortable almost ever it's a it, outside of them coming out and throwing the ball three times to open up against Alabama. It's we're going to run the ball. We're going to run the ball. We're going to run the ball. And then we're going to run it some more because that's exactly who John uh, Jim Harbaugh is. He, that's just who he is. And you don't get that development. You don't see a ton of diff, having to get through all of your reads. You have like one, two, take off and run or one and run or one and check down. Like it's, it's not a complex quarterback system. So the tools are there. Mental processing, he, he does keep his eyes. The one thing I tell you right now, this guy does not bring his eyes down. He, <laughs> he never brings he his is, eyes down. <laughs> he's always looking to make a play. And obviously it's a detriment yeah. to him at times. So he'll take a sack or he'll think he can make a play that he can't make. Or he'll lock into a receiver and he doesn't take his eyes off him. All those things. And the highs, man. That's why people are talking about him in the first round. Teams will be like, Look at this play and ignore the last 20 of them and say, look at this play. And then everything else, I can fix that. You guys have seen, you know, uh, holes, right? You guys have seen it. I can fix that. He's the handyman. They can fix everything. These teams will think they can fix every single thing on J.J. McCarthy. But it's not always going to be that that way. So I don't think he's ready to be in the NFL. Now, if he landed in San Francisco, we have a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, I think... JJ McCarthy going pro is very interesting if he does because he hasn't announced yet that he's correct that he's going. I don't believe it's hard to keep track. We're right up against the the deadline for who's declared and who hasn't. So staying yeah. apprised of every name is tricky right now. But to my knowledge, he has not declared, and it wouldn't make sense for him to before the national championship, anyways. So if he does come out, and like you said, these evaluators are looking at him, going, "Man, the the." the top end of the spectrum of what he's capable of is so nice, but the bottom is rough. I don't know how you don't have like a round three grade on him as a high level backup. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how you look at him and go, he's someone that we think is coming in and starting right away. He's not ready to start. If you're one of these teams that has a bridge starter in place, maybe uh, the saints, if they don't make a splash draft pick and they want to take someone on day two, that can sit behind Derek Carr until Derek Carr gets hurt again in week three. And then JJ is forced into action early. (laughs) That's how I see that going. But one of these teams that has a bridge quarterback already, maybe that's a scenario where they look at taking a JJ McCarthy because you're not asking him to walk in to being a day one or even a year one starter. And you hope that you see development out of him in practice and that eventually he, he takes the keys. Yeah, that's the hope, right? You're just hoping that he 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 gets there, he develops. But like I said, this game, those two quarterbacks match up between Minter and, and Penix is probably my X factor right now. Uh, th- this game is going to be so much fun, and it, there's so much more to the Washington defense too. There are some yeah. legitimate players out there that I think that Michigan's going to be able to run the ball. I, I do. I think that they're going to get back to themselves a little bit. They kind of got away from it against Alabama, and they found it near the end of the game and said, hey, hey, Blake Corum, he's a pretty good guy, pretty good p- football player, and we're going to get him the football, and look what happened. 
You, you know, you know who else is a pretty good football player is Donovan <laughs> Edwards, uh, who Donovan have Edwards not is been leaning much on. So yeah, I could it's... see them wanting to go a one-two punch a little bit with their running backs in this game and really uh, establish it in the in the ways of old. Right. Absolutely. So this looking is, uh... at the looking at the other players that you're talking about, some key players that that Washington has on defense. We're gonna we're gonna keep this fairly quick here, but Braylon Trice. He was absolutely everywhere. Insane. Last Insane. week. Uh, he had a forced fumble on special teams while also having like multiple sacks. And just he was all over the field on like every phase of the game. Braylon Trice is a guy that's capable of being a game wrecker. Now, Michigan has a pretty damn good offensive line. So that's going to be one of those battles as well. Is Trice going to be able to impact the game? from the defensive side of the ball or is the Michigan offensive line going to be able to hold up? Yeah. And, th and that's, again, another one of these, there's so many different kinds of impacts that can have on this game. If, if Trice is able to do what he did against Texas against Michigan, they're going to have a lot of problems. That's where you see the run game come in is because they are, will continuously attack that in the run game and force Trice to have to guess. If you have to guess, if you have to guess if it's run or play action or, or RPO, that's really going to impact how Trice can be because he was the big – people were really, like, confused about Trice. Like, where did this guy come from? Have you guys seen his pressure numbers? The good dude's all around the quarterback. He's everywhere. He just – he didn't have the sack numbers. But yeah. getting after the quarterback in college is a little bit different. And it, it translates to the NFL in largely the same way. If you generate pressure, if you're around the quarterback, you're typically around the quarterback and you generate pressure in the NFL. And those sacks will come. They will come with time. Pressures are the big indicator here. And Braylon Trice has a ton of tools. He's probably not the bendiest guy in the world, but he's a very good corner player. And what I mean by that is he will get to the edge when he's pretty much parallel with that tackle. He can get his foot in the ground and turn it down the line. That is yeah. what we talk about when we say the word corner for a defensive end. He has counters with his hands, inside and outside counters. He has a lot of different things that he can do with his hands, rip, swipe push pull he has a lot of different things that he can do and just attack offensive tackle so i wonder how michigan's gonna address him are they gonna chip him are they just gonna kind of maybe run at him and not block yeah. him and make him think a little bit i'm interested i am too i mean i could see this being a big jumbo package game for michigan i could see them just oh, yeah. Two just tight ends all just... the time yeah and just running at him running like a double power you know what i mean having multiple pulling offensive line when the tight ends are crashing down and just trying to clear trice out of the way and run around yeah. that edge so it's going to be really interesting to see what the game plan is um it's 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 going to be fun i this is i haven't been this excited about a national championship game in a number of years because it's not your typical it's not the usual suspects it's not the usual suspects i'm i'm a west coast guy born and raised oregon so pac-12 and in the final year of the pac-12 washington's representing the national in the national championship and then they're going to the Big Ten next year where they're going to have to play Michigan. Like, it is just – <laughs> the symmetry of it is gorgeous, and I love it so much. And the players are just damn good, too. On the offensive side of the ball for Washington, they have an offensive lineman uh, that we're going to get to look at, by the way, yes, in about three and we a half are. weeks. Troy Fatanu. Man, oh, man, he's nasty. Um, if, if I'm a Michigan fan like you are – and by the way, I live in Michigan right now, so uh, – <laughs> But if I'm a Michigan fan like you, Troy Fatanu, outside of Roma Dunze, uh, Troy Fatanu is one of the guys that I think is a key element to this game. Is he able to do the nasty work and hold up uh, against the defensive front, or are they going to be able to in some way scheme it and, and create some pressures off of him? You're not going to get past him. It's just not yeah. going to happen. Troy Fatanu is too good. There's talk about whether he's a guard or a tackle. Um, I saw uh, – that there is reports that his uh, arm length is like 34 and three quarters. And if that's the case, yeah. I say you leave him at tackle at the next level. There's no reason not to. He's good enough. He's a, he's a great prospect. Um, you're not going to get past him, but are they going to be able to create some stunts and some doubles to generate pressure in other ways? Yeah, that's the big thing here. And, the, you know, I've got, I actually have done my breakdown of Troy Fatan, uh, uh, Troy Fatan. Like he's, He's so fun. <laughs> He's just so much fun. And, yeah. and the fact that we're sitting here right now and people are talking about him finally as a senior and still trying to figure out if he can he can play tackle in the NFL. Yes. Yes, yes he can. Even if he had 
sub 33 or sub 34 inch arms. I'm playing him a tackle. His footwork is fantastic. The, the athlete, it's not even just the athleticism, it's the recovery athleticism. It's the way he sets up ta- the way he sets up defensive ends. He can do the ghost hands. He can he throws them in there at times. It makes you show your hand. He has the ability, you know, the, the hip flip. If you're going outside and countering inside, he can flip his hips, keep those hands on the outside. I do say he does attack to the out his his outside hand too much. He throws his outside hand too much, and what that does is it invites those inside counters because it's not uh, it's not in his chest. If you get your inside hand as a left tackle and you're inside the chest with your inside, you have control over left or right. If it's just your outside, you're moving to your left, and then your inside's out leveraged, and you can get out leveraged by defensive ends that way. So there are some things he needs to clean up in that department with his hand moves, but his footwork and his recovery athleticism is, is fantastic. He's got multiple pass sets. You know, he can jump set, he can short set, he can 45 degree, he can vertical, he can do all of those things. He's a fantastic player. So Michigan is going to try to confuse him. They're going to mug up linebackers. They're going to bring Mike Sanders. So these deep DBs off the edge, they're going to try to make him think, overthink it, open up a B gap, open up an A gap and try to find ways to get after Penix early and off that left side because they want to move him to his right. So you have to attack through right. Potano to get there. So that's another interesting chess match about the whole thing. Yep. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a really good point uh, with the left-handed quarterback. You're trying to get the quarterback yeah. to roll to the right. That's his weak side right now, but that's you got to get past the best offense alignment, arguably the best offense alignment in the Pac-12. Uh, there's a tackle out of Oregon State that we're also going to see uh, down there who, who might have a stake to that conversation as well. But Troy Vitano is a beast and he's a road grader too, man. He is nasty on the short yardage work too. And he's capable of just blowing people off the ball. So it's a lot of fun. I just, I don't know. Okay. Michigan fan, let's go prediction. What do you, what do you got? Yeah. What are you saying? Just, just one, one last thing on Troy, like his red zone blocking was, I, I did not expect to see what I saw. It's he dangerous. Pad level, get down and move people in the red zone was far better than I expected expected to because of what you know he's not necessarily asked to do that inside the 20s it's not really what he's asked to do he is a get to the second level move kind of guy so i was very impressed to see that and i was like yep sold um but yes michigan player michigan fan sorry i'm picking with my brain and my heart in this matchup i think minter is going to be too much i think his defense is going to be too much um he's not reinventing the wheel or anything guys this stuff has been around since wink martindale it's been re it's been thrown through the cycle but what he is doing right now the only way i think that washington would be able to overcome what minter is going to do is if he could run the ball like Jalen milrow did last week because that was the one chink in the armor that they had is that he could run the ball michael Penix, i, I think is fantastic i think he's going to get his in this football game don't get me wrong he's going to get his going to get a deep shot every now and then and you're going to see that happen uh, i think that we're going to have tackles we're going to have tackles for loss we're going to have some sacks in this game uh, i i think that glasgow michigan's defensive lineman who has been everywhere may, may, may excuse me is it am i i might be thinking of a completely different person just let me work through the, the list here because i'm <laughs> i think i'm thinking of a completely different person i meant mason graham my apologies Glad there's, there's been lots of Glasgow's there. They're in the NFL now. So I just brain working all the way. These defensive linemen power, they're physical and they're athletic for 318 plus pound guys. Like they're just, they're different. So I think Michigan's going to win this football game. And I think it's going to be relatively high scoring because I think Washington's still going to get theirs. Um, but I think the run game from Michigan is going to be able to put up, put some points on the board. I don't have a score prediction, but I do think Michigan comes out on top. Uh, I, yeah, I, I can't disagree. If you told me either way, I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. This is just a great chess match of a game between yeah. strength on strength. And uh, I, I agree with you. I think the Michigan run game could be a differentiating factor in this game because they are capable of getting after it and grinding it out. Um, I'll tell you though, Romo Dunze, you want to talk about a guy with a showcase game. If he's able to come out here and just ball out against the, the Michigan secondary, uh, man, it's going to be really, really hard not to have him looking like a top, you know, seven to 10 
seven to 10 pick. I think he's that yeah. good of a wide receiver. So it's, it's going to be fun, man. There's just all kinds of guys all over the field. Uh, don't sleep on the secondary wide receivers for Washington either, man. Jalen uh, Polk, Jalen Polk's a Jim stud, Polk. man. Much like uh, Brian yeah. Thomas in his own right, speed, deep ball player. Like they're very similar players. I'm very excited yep. about that too, especially because yeah. the secondary, that the one guy you want to attack is going to be the one covering Jalen Polk. So he might have himself a big day. Yep. It's going to be interesting. Well, Hey, it is uh Time that we wrap this up right on the hour mark here. If this is your first time listening to us, thank you for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we're stoked. I we're just we're so excited to get to do this and and bring this content to you guys and continue to grow the the production value of this show with all the funs <laughs> and bells and whistles, which will start happening soon and and really bring some great content to you. Uh, next week we are going to start looking ahead to the Senior Bowl. Because right after college football is over on Monday, it is 100% full steam ahead, draft oh, season, yeah. baby, and we are in it. So for us, I'm John. That's Daniel. We're uh, excited to be here, and we'll talk to you guys next week.